Hello, everyone. My name is Morgan. I'm here today for Hidden Beats with a very special guest, Josh Ramsey of Mariana's Trench. And we're here today to discuss his upcoming breakout solo career uh, with the launch of his new single, Lady Mine. It's a collaboration with Chad Kroger of Nickelback. So thank you very much for taking your time to talk to me today. Um, it's a huge honor. And like he said, I've been to a good 15 plus Marina Trench shows. So oh, thank wow. <laughs> well, thank you then. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you. Uh, so let's get started. So how did you and Chad become friends and get this collaboration to come alive? I first met Chad. Um, Chad is the co-owner of 604 Records, which uh, Mariana's Trench was I think the second band that they signed. Um, so I'm initially, I remember meeting Chad for the first time when uh, him and Jonathan, who is my manager and the other owner of 604 Records, were looking for a building. They were looking for a building to have 604 Records in. And I went looking at buildings with them that day. And I met Chad for the first time there. Um, and we just sort of got along really well right away. Um, and it's really funny, like, I think a lot of people, um, cause his persona on stage is pretty serious. I think a lot of people think that he's like a serious guy but actually he's like the biggest class clown ever. Um, so I think we kind of like got along well that just cause we were, we're, both, we're both silly. Um, so I think we got along really easily. And then we just sort of uh, stayed friends this whole time. Um, and then uh, ooh, I, in, in about 20, 16, I want to say, or 2015, I can't remember exactly. I got a text from him one time and I had put out, I had just put out a song called Pop 101. And um, and, and like, you know, I'd go, we'd go to parties and stuff together over the years. And, and I got, I had put out Pop 101 and he sent me a text being like, uh, you know, I, I just heard that song. It's really, really clever. Um, and I said, oh, thanks, man. You know, what are you up to? And he said, oh, I'm working on a Nickelback record in Maui. And I was like, Phew fuck you too uh <laughs> yeah and then and then he was like do you want to do you want to come and write some songs with me and i was like seriously uh and he's like yeah and i was on a plane to maui the next day and you know working on this nickelback record with them um and we sort of really became like good buds at that, that point because we've spent a lot of time around each other working on that um and then when it came to this uh i actually asked chad to sing on a song of mine before and he was going to but he didn't have time there's a mariana's trench song called astoria and mm -hmm. there's a there's a little tagline after the chorus um that my sister sang but uh, originally it was going to be chad going do i survive you astoria da -da -da. he was going to do that um and uh, he just didn't have time so um when I got to Lady Mine, I was working on the song and I thought, well, I'm gonna ask him to sing something on this record. Cause there's a lot of, I'm gonna do a lot of collabs and I, I, I would love for us to do a song together. And I was working on that song. And at first I was like, well, who could I, who could I ask to sing on this? And I was like, well, I could ask Chad, he would sound amazing on this. And I liked the idea of that because it doesn't really sound like a song people would associate with me or a song people would associate with him. So it was kind of a departure for both of us. And I liked that about it. And I knew he would sound amazing on it. And um, and then I started thinking like, well, wait a minute, who else other than Chad could I even ask to sing this? Who else could sing this? It's gotta be Chad, it's just gotta be him. So then I really like wrote it, finished it with, with him, him in mind. Um, and then actually when I called him and asked him to, to sing on it, I didn't, I wasn't like, hey, will you sing on this song? I was just like, hey, can I send you this song I've been working on? And if you like it, you know, you could maybe be open to singing on it. And I, I actually think maybe he'd had a couple of drinks at the time. And, and he was just like, ah, buddy, just send it over. I'll, I'll sing it. And he said yes to singing on the song without having ever heard it. <laughs> well, that's good. Um, so like collabs, I've heard that um, there's going to be a lot more familiar voices on the album too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there any more like remarkable stories um, with working with other these extraordinary Canadian icons too? Um, yeah, I mean, the whole thing was really fun. I mean, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people uh, like, I mean, so I, I mean, I made the record during pandemic, right? So there were, that had its, its pluses and it had its minuses. Its pluses were that basically everyone was available. No one was on the road, nobody was on tour, right? So like pretty much everyone was available. And I was very fortunate enough that pretty much everyone I asked said yes. 
um, which was really great. Um, but I wasn't actually there for a lot of people recording. Like it was more like people would just send me vocal tracks. Um, uh, for example, like Serena Ryder, she just sent, she sent me her vocals. And I mean, I was also really fortunate enough that all of these people are all great, great singers who don't really need a producer, not, not, and they don't need a producer to, to, to produce a vocal performance of them. They're, they're fine. They're, they're going to, they're going to send you something awesome. Um, uh, like Serena is a great example. Like I, she sent me her vocal tracks. I listened to it once. And I just started laughing because it was so it was so good. It was so, so good that I just started laughing. I was like, well, it's not going to get better than that because <laughs> she's such an awesome singer. Um, and it was it was really an honor to get to work with so many great singers on this album. Uh, one there was one song. There's a song with Tyler Shaw called um, Can't Give It Up. And that one was going to be uh, uh, I, I initially wrote it. Um, I initially wrote it. Uh, and I was just going to sing it. I was just going to sing it. And it had a bit of back and forth stuff in the end, end section. And I was like, I was in the studio mixing, like the album was done. We were mixing it. And I was like, ah, I really think I, I should, I should ask someone to sing on this. It would sound better as a duet. Who do I know that would sound great on this? And Tyler popped into my head because he's such a great singer. And I, I knew him, uh, we knew each other and I texted him. I, I was like, dude, I know this is so last minute. Um, but I, I'm, I'm mixing the song, but like, I've got this song. Do you think you might be interested in singing on it? Can I send it to you and you can listen to it? And Tyler, great guy that he is, said yes. And he sent me a finished vocal track the next morning. So I was like, awesome, dude. Thank you so much. Um, and he sounds fantastic on it. He sounds just, just as, as great as I knew he would. Um, and I, I think one of the really fun things about this record as a whole was all of the songs are initially the, the, the first recorded version was just me singing the whole thing and just picturing what it would sound like with another singer on there. But then as people started sending me tracks, then hearing how much a song changed its personality when another singer got involved and like was interpreting it their own way and making it their own. Um, and because I was used to hearing it with just me, but then like like hearing it with with a new singer in there would totally change the story of the song, and the, and just having a di different person's perspective on it would really change it. Um, the country song that I did with Dallas Smith, um, Dallas and I knew each other for years. Um, on my band on my first album, my band used to open for Default when he was in Default, um, and uh, I knew Dallas was a really kick-ass singer, and um, we had talked. We had talked many times over the years that we should do something together at some point. And then I started working on a country song and I was like, I should, I should ask Dallas to sing on this because actually I was having some problems with the vocal on, on the country song because I was like, it sounds too much like, it sounds too much like me and I, and I don't sound like a country singer. So I real I really worked hard on the vocal. You haven't heard that song yet, I don't think, but but I worked really hard on the on that vocal because I wanted it to sound right for the genre, and I didn't want it to sound like an SNL caricature of of a country singer. I didn't want it, you know, it, it still needed to be to come from a real place. I worked really hard on that vocal, and I wrote the song picturing Dallas singing, like I pictured his voice the whole time. Uh, and I wrote it for hoping that he would say yes. And thank God he did. Um, and he came in, we, we were doing, we, we recorded a live version of it and a studio version of it sort of the same day. And we were at the warehouse studio in Vancouver. We recorded the acoustic thing and he came in and I, I, I'm, I don't think I've ever seen a, a professional singer lay down a vocal that fast. It was, it was one of the fastest. He's so, so consistently a great singer that guy has never seen never met an out of tune note in his life like he's just he's, he's so great he sat there and the frustrating thing for me too is like he said it, he i think his whole vocal i think it i think it took 15 minutes maybe 20 minutes to record him um needing zero direction from me just like hit record and okay go go for it and the thing that pissed me off is he sounds like that. He sounds that good. And he's, he's so consistent and he didn't even look like he was trying. <laughs> it was like, it was seriously like between takes, he's just like looking at his phone, just like whatever. And then, okay, okay, let's go. And then just like, boom, just huge vocals come out of him. He's uh he's an amazing, amazing singer. Uh, that's good. You have so many musician friends that like tackle all those different genres that you said are going to be on the album, different genres, which is what I'm most excited for. 
So, so sorry, you cut out a little bit there. I didn't hear. I didn't hear that. Sorry. Um, it's nice all the friends you have with different genres, which are going to be covered on the album, which is what yeah. I'm most excited for. Um, yeah. Speaking of the different genres on almost every song, is there a genre you tried that was like the most challenging or like a new favorite genre at all? Um, there's some stuff that people are going to be like, he did what? Um, <laughs> like, I mean, it's, it, there's 18 tracks, right? So it's, it's, there's a lot of information. Um, it's the longest album I've written. Um, I, I think in a lot of ways, it, um, it's one of the most inspired albums. I've maybe the most or, or right up there that and Astoria are like my two most inspired times. I think what I was really inspired about this is as soon as I was like, okay, I'm not making a Mariana's Trench record. It's not a Mariana's Trench record. I like, I don't think anybody would appreciate me just making a Mariana's Trench record by myself. I'm not going to do that. So, okay. So I'm going to do as many genres as possible. So as soon as I know I'm making choices that wouldn't go on a Mariana's Trench record, there's actually something very freeing about that being like, okay, I'm going to do whatever I can think of all over the place. And so I think some of the stuff that like, I mean, okay, you, you have heard the lady mine, you've heard that song, right? So that's track one on the album. So the album starts with this big, <laughs> uh, and I think people, but track two is full on like 1940s big band swing. And I think people are going to be like, what? <laughs> but it's really fun. It's really, really fun. Um, the song's called Blame It on the Beat. It's really fun. And, but it uh, that one was a really fun one to work on because I've never had a situation where I've been like, I'm going to do big band swing. Uh, so that was fun. That was just fun. Uh, writing all the horn parts for that and stuff was just fun. Um, oh, did I lose you there? Your camera's off. Oh, your camera's gone. Um, so yeah, that, that one was really fun. I did, um, uh, are, are we still going? Yes, you can keep going. Okay. I'm just trying to get the camera back on. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I worked, um, I, you know, there's a couple of like very poppy songs, but I wanted to make sure that if I did some pop, if there was going to be some pop songs, then I wanted to make sure there were some rock songs too. So like Lady Mine came from that. Um, there's like a full on like 1991 grunge song on there that is really fun. Um, I had a lot of fun working on that. Um, I looked up, I wanted to, I was very meticulous about it. So I, I like looked up like what were the specific guitar pedals that Kurt Cobain used and not just like what pedals, but like what year were they made? And I scoured the internet to get duplicates of the, like to like, so it's, like it was a very produced for, for grunge, it's very produced, but uh, it, it's like all of, all of 1991 in three minutes of screaming, it's fine. Um, but then there's also like, um, like the, like the song that I did with Tyler Shaw, like that really feels more like something that like Adele might do or something like that. Very like hard on your sleeve ballad. Um, and then uh, there's, there's, um, there were two songs that I wrote that are really um, centerpiece songs on the album, I think. I think there's, I think there's a lot of songs that I would say are like centerpiece things, but um, I, I lost both my parents last year, sort of like six months apart from each other. And I wanted to write each of them a song that wasn't not like a not a big sad song, but like a I love you, you know, I love you, mom, dad. Um, so I wrote one for each of them. And my mom, that song is uh she really grew up on like the Beatles and um the 60s and the 70s. And so I wanted to write a song in in a Beatles-y style. So like they used to do these sort of like stripped down pop songs that featured like overdubbed orchestral instruments um, that kind of sound a little bit goofy. Um, and that's perfect because my mom was a little bit goofy um, and a little bit magical. And so it kind of sounds like Disneyland a little bit, this song, um, but it's called Spellbound, so it makes sense. Um, that one was really fun to work on. It was like a string, uh, string quintet and then like a tuba and a trombone as the only time I've ever been working with other instrument other players where I was actually giving them notes like can you play it a bit goofier can you make it just a little sillier because they're like Wah! like that type of stuff um and then the song from my dad um I learned a lot about musical arranging from my dad so I wanted to write something a really epic arrangement so I wrote him a full symphony a full symphony orchestra and that song um because of COVID um we couldn't record a whole symphony at once because too many people in a room. So I recorded an entire symphony orchestra four people at a time, um, which took 
which took forever. It took forever. And then the editing of that took forever. And the song ended up being, because of that, ended up being like around 400 tracks. So just the, just the making of that song was like the most epic recording session I've ever attempted. It was just like, I can't believe we pulled it off actually. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, I heard you're playing most, if not like almost all of the instruments on the record too. I played, uh, I played everything except for the symphony stuff. I didn't I, like, they played that. I did play cello on a song, but they, they, they you know, I, I did not play the symphony orchestra and any song where there's a horn section, uh, it's a real, it's real horns, but I, I don't, I didn't play any horns. Were there any of the instruments that like you had to learn or were challenging or different new? Yeah, a cello. Um, so I, I, I didn't play cello before and I'm not a master at it now, but there was, there was one little spot where I was like, this is really just gotta be a solo cello and samples of solo cellos just didn't sound real enough. And I was like, well, I have a cello. My parents gave me a cello years ago. Okay, okay, I'm just I'm, I'm gonna figure it out so I can just play this part. <laughs> so you know, it took me a while, but um, but I got there, um, uh, and I'm gonna continue to learn that instrument. Um, the other one that I hadn't played, there was a couple instruments that like I'm proficient at, but I hadn't played in a long time. Um, I was out of shape in terms of playing drums. I hadn't played drums in a while, so I like I you know I needed like a day or two of playing to like get my chops back up. Um, and I hadn't played harmonica in years, um, but I had been good at it at one time, like at one time in my life. So I was like, okay, I'm just gonna, gonna brush off the dust and remember how to play this thing. So that, that took a bit of practicing as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was fun. I mean, it, it kind of reminded me of being a teenager again, because when I was a teenager, there was a, there was a studio at home. There was a console at home to use. And that my dad used. And I used to, I basically learned to, to play all the instruments that I can play. I, I basically just, it's not actually as impressive as, as it sounds, first of all, like for people who aren't musicians, because actually it's, if you know music theory, then really learning another instrument is just learning how to apply the same notes onto a, 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 with a different technique, but it's still the same notes. So if you know music theory, picking up other instruments really isn't actually all that impressive. Um, it's just, it, it, like I said, it's still the same notes. Middle C is still middle C. So if you understand how that stuff works, it's not that difficult to pick up other things. It's difficult to be like Eddie Van Halen shredder on something, but to, to be functional on a lot of instruments isn't particularly difficult. Um, but uh, yeah, I think like the, like getting the, getting my drum chops back up was fun and getting my harmonica chops back up was fun. Um, but yeah, I, I really felt like, like I, like I was a, when I was a teenager, because when I was a teenager, I learned all of those instruments because I wanted to record songs and I needed, I didn't have a band. So I, I wanted to, I was like, okay, well, this song needs bass. I guess I'm going to have to learn how to play bass. Like that's how, that's what I did through my teens. So it kind of reminded me of being a teenager and recording songs by myself. I sort of hadn't done it since then. It reminded me a lot of that, which was a lot of fun. Well, since you did write the album with different genres to not sound like super Marianas trenchy, um, can we expect any like Marianas trying to spice with like the overture outros and orchestra arrangements and such? I can hear a little bit of it in Lady Mine, you know, the three part harmony uh, part. Yeah, the, uh, there's a little, there's, a, I mean, there's cer certainly a couple of songs. There's a couple of songs that could have gone on a Marianas Trench record, but I wrote them now, so that they went on this. And I mean, it it doesn't. I mean, you guys have heard Lady Mine, like it it doesn't sound like Marianas Trench, but it does. My voice still it still sounds like me. It still sounds like my voice. My voice sounds like my voice. Um, for better or for worse, this is what I got. Um, but there are there are two. There are like uh, there's two songs that. Uh, like the symphony song, I could have put that on a Mariana Strange record, I guess, but it it's not like the other guys would have played on it because it features the symphony orchestra. So, um, but it does, the symphony song does have a section that goes into a whole bunch of vocals. So they, they, there's a little, so there's a, there's a little bit of that in there. There's a couple of songs that have, have a little bit. Um, I mean, I tried to stay away from that stuff for the most part because I feel like that's a really defining part of the Mariana's Trench sound. But, you know, that's also a really defining thing about me as a songwriter. So there's a little bit of it in there, but it, but it, there's not a ton of it. But there, there's there, the couple spots where it does go for it with vocals, it really goes for it. Like there's the bridge in the song I wrote for my mom. You'll see. All of a sudden it's like, whoa, vocals. <laughs> so a slightly unrelated question, but okay. in light of Spotify Wrapped coming out with their 
2020 run wrapped who would be your top three most listened to artists or songs of the past year well honestly it's this is going to sound terrible but it makes sense when you think about it it would be me because i've just been working on this album straight this is all i've been listening to because i've been working this but it's not like listening to it like working on it. but that's all i've really been doing for the last year is just working on this one record so i haven't really i'm not very i'm not very caught up at the moment i need to this always happens to me when i'm working on stuff um, when I get done an album, now I'm like, okay, now what do I need to be listening to? Because I haven't been really listening to much. <laughs> well, that's all I have for you today. And thank you very much for taking your time out of your day to talk to me. Um, oh, thank I'm you really, for having me. I'm really excited for the album to come out and happy holidays. Okay, thank you so much. Happy holidays to you too. Thank you. Have a nice Bye. day.